Um, welcome. Yeah. Welcome. You know, uh, we believe in being in each other's lives here in the church. Yeah. And uh, recently I got somebody talked to me about my lessons. Because I talk a lot about suffering. Uh-oh. <laughs> and he told me not to preach this morning about suffering. Oh, yeah. so, amen. I'm not going to preach about it. Um, but the reason I preach about it is because I, um, this week was my mother's birthday on August 3rd. She would have been 95 years old, and my dad would have been 97 this year. So in 1922 versus 2022, you know, almost 100 years ago, my parents were born. My dad was a rugged individual. Jeannie's dad was a rugged, rugged man. I mean, it was, uh, I, I could never measure up with what they went through. Uh, through the Depression, World War II, you know, when, they, when the service people, the men and women came, or primarily the men, in World War II, in Europe, um, the people in Europe, like France and Germany, labeled the American army as weak, yep. oh. sentimental, and soft. Oh. But we won the war. Yeah. But if that was the label 70 years ago, what do you think we are today? <laughs> so when suffering and hardships come, I talk about it a lot because... I know my dad went, he never complained, never took aspirin, never went to the doctor, lost all his teeth by the time he was 30. I mean, it was, there was no money. People were poor. Yeah. Um, but I, I think like that, it's like, so anyway, that's why I talk about it all the time. But this morning, I'm not going to talk about it. Amen. Yeah. Uh, this morning, I want to talk to you about prayer. Um, so I have a question. It's rhetorical. So did your prayers move God's heart this morning? Did your prayers move God's heart this morning? Um, you know, if we want God to move in our lives, we need to be a people of prayer. You know, um, so that's the title of the lesson, a people of prayer. So if you would, turn over to Psalm chapter 5. Psalm chapter 5. Psalm 5, verse 1. It's a little different lesson than what I'm used to, but I wanted to share it with you. I've been studying it in my quiet times, in my time with God. On, Psalm 5, verse 1 says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my sighing. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. So would your prayers this morning, did you say a lot of words? Did you share your heart? Did you cry? Did you have size? Did you, did you, you know, present your request to God? You know, what did it look like? Think oh, about it. How was it this morning? Uh, what, do you do, what do your prayers look like on the everyday? Uh, do you pour out your heart? Or you just get in the car and say, blah, 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 say a couple words and you hit it, you go to work. Um, do you express your feelings to God? Do you interact with God? I got to tell you this morning, I got up at 5 o'clock and... Has everybody here been to my home? Well, I know Stephen hasn't been to my home. Uh, but I think everybody else, well, the visitors haven't been to my home, our friends who just showed up. Uh, but I have this little porch. Well, it's not that little, but it's screened in, and I have a swamp in my backyard. Uh, and I have a gator. We have otters. We have snakes. We have uh, you name it, foxes, uh, uh, armadillos, and possums. And, uh, yeah, we pretty much got the gamut. Um, but I sat out there at 5 o'clock, and it's dead silent, and just nature and me. No mosquitoes because I got screens. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> but but it, was, um, it was awesome just to interact with God in that quiet time, in that space, um, to be able to lay my request to God and wait for him to answer me. Uh, now, did he answer this morning? Hopefully this lesson will be okay. Did he answer my prayer? <laughs> but anyway... Uh, just, just think about your own prayers. How was it this week? You know, think about it. Cries, sighs, tears. Uh, present your request. So let's look at a prayer in Nehemiah. Back a few books. Let's go, Jack. To the, le- to the left. To the left. Oh, thank you. Nehemiah, chapter 1. Nehemiah 1, verse 5. It says, Then I said, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenants of love with those who love him and obey his commands. 
Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. <clears throat> so pretty bold right here. You know, he said, God, listen, listen to my ear. Hear me. Listen to what I'm saying. Open your eyes and listen. Do you say that? Do you ever think like that in your prayer time? Sure. Uh, hear me, God. You know, it's pretty, pretty bold. Are your prayers bold? Um, you pray day and night? Uh, when I have to do a lesson like this, I've been praying all week, just so you know. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Woo! It's, <laughs> yeah. In, um, in, if you look in verse 11, it's the same chapter. It says, give your servant success today by granting him a favor in the presence of this man. So, you know, do you ask God for success? Do you even think like that? Uh, do you think like Nehemiah here? God, give me success today. Give me success on my job. Don't let my job take me out. Don't let the people that I work with take me out uh, and just crush me today. Don't let my boss crush me today. Um, those of you who are bosses, be kind to your people. Amen. Um, you know, but do you ask for success? You know, I think it's important that we're specific. I think sometimes I can just mumble and just kind of, and then I'll be it's like, oh, stop. You know, I got to stop and think, what am I saying? You know, I'm talking to the God of the universe in my backyard, and he created all those creatures in my backyard, all those animals. He created the swamp. I mean, I have a swamp. It's a legitimate swamp. I love it. I love sitting out there. I can't see anything but the swamp. And so I can space out. I don't have to see my neighbors. Uh, you know, it's pretty amazing, you know. But God answers prayers as well. Look in chapter 2, right here in Nehemiah. In chapter 2, it says in, the, in chapter, or verse 1, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so downcast when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I, I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. You know, the king saw that he was sad. Um, but Nehemiah was afraid. You ever been afraid? Yeah. Uh, you know, when you're afraid, do you present your request to God? Do you really open up about your fears? <clears throat> and in verse 5 there, it says he prayed while he was asking. You ever pray when you're talking to somebody? Like, God, get me through this yeah. conversation, yes. oh, baby. Uh, let me not lose my mind right here. Let me think. Uh, I was talking to Nell here this morning. She's an Uber driver. And I drove Uber for a year up in D.C. And I had to pray through some of those People that got in my car, I was like, Whew, man, you never know what you're going to get. Every ride is a different ride. It's like, how short is this one? I hope it's a short ride. <laughs> Baby, yeah. Uh, I had a couple pretty testy experiences there. But do you think like that? Do you pray while you're in the middle of something? Like when you're in, in the heat of the moment or something's going bad for you? Or do you, or you're talking to somebody, do you pray through that? You know, uh, I've learned to look people right here and keep my eyes planted on, on their nose. Otherwise, I'm like, whew, you know, I'm looking around and, you know, I'm trying to stay focused, you know. If I look at their eyes and they're looking around, then I want to look around. It's like, you know. But, you know, and with that, I try to focus in and pray and think about what they're saying to me. I have a hard time sometimes. I'm not the great listener. Um, I don't know that any of us are. You know? Do you ever have your thoughts already prepared before the person finishes the sentence? None of you do that, right? Just me? No, oh, yeah. Okay. You're already thinking, I got a response for this. Stop talking. Or you interrupt the person. Oh, baby. Yeah. Um, but you know, God gives, us, God gives us answers. But it may not be the one you want. But it may be the one you need. Yeah. So if you turn over to Jonah, 
Jonah, chapter 2. Everybody knows about Jonah, right? Jonah. <laughs> Got the audience here. <laughs> Jonah 2, verse 7. Jonah 2, 7. It says, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Um, you know, Jonah's pretty desperate right here. He prayed when he saw his life ebbing away. You know what ebbing means? Yeah. It means things are in a decline. And when you're 75 years old, you know it's declining. Uh, so I can truly say that my life is ebbing away. Maybe yours, not so much. Um, but, you know, he remembered the Lord when he was faced with death. Um, I've got to tell you, there's, I've had, I have a list on my phone about 14 times where I came really close to dying. Um, but two of them, um, well, one in particular stands out. I was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and some of you have heard the story. <clears throat> I had two friends in the church. One of them knew how to scuba dive, and he was certified. Me and my other guy there, we didn't know what we were doing. But we rented some equipment anyway, and we did a beach dive, which is stupid to begin with. You should always go out on a boat, kind of fall backwards. You're, you're at the reefs. It's pretty easy. But we did a beach dive, and I had all the, you know, I, and I knew what a tank was. I knew it had a vest. I had done enough snorkeling. I had the mask, and, and, and I had the flag so the boats wouldn't run over. So I was kind of pulling the flag along. So we swam out. It was a pretty rough day, which is not the smartest thing either. We got out to the first reef, which is about 100, 150 yards out. It's beautiful, but my equipment was faulty. And, uh, and so it was, the guy that was certified, he went down right away. He was in the reef looking for lobster, and, you know. Um, my other friend, he was doing okay too, and he got down. I couldn't get down. I couldn't get the vest to work. I couldn't get the oxygen mask to work, or the tank rather. <clears throat> so it was, it, was a, it was a little bit of a rough time. And to say the least, I had a panic attack. Uh, and it was not a little panic attack, it was full blown. Um, and I lost my mind. Literally, I couldn't think a reason. You ever had a panic attack? All right. Um, and so I, I tried to get all the equipment off. I got the mask off. I think I threw it. But I couldn't get the weight belt off. That was the one I wanted off. And if I could have lost the tank, I rented it, I would have paid. I didn't care. But I couldn't get it off because my reasoning, my sense of reasoning was uh, literally gone. And so uh, I was probably 35 at the time. And I was still, yeah, different, different shape than I have now. <laughs> Uh, and I was a good swimmer. I grew up on the ocean uh, or in pools, so I could swim really, really well. Not a, it's not a boat. So I could just, I knew how to swim. So all I could do, I had the flippers still on. I kicked my way all the way back to the beach. But in the process, I've never, ever, before or since, prayed like I prayed at that time. It probably took me 15 minutes to get to the shore. It was, it was close. It was really close to dying. Because, I mean, it would have only taken like seven, eight feet of water, and I would, it would have been done. I just, but I prayed like crazy. I mean, I cried out. Like in, in, in Psalms, I cried out. I, it was just literally, I was on my, I wasn't on my knees, but uh, in fact, I couldn't stand up when I got to the shore because I was spent. But I just think about that. That's my barometer. Wow. I've had a few prayers like that. Another one was in D.C. I didn't come close to dying that time. My son came close to dying. In the middle of a park in a snowstorm, and I was so uh, caught up in the grief that I literally just dropped to my knees and prayed out loud in front of whoever was there. I don't know who was there. Uh, but what do your prayers look like? What's your barometer? What, what do you think about? Uh, maybe you have to be faced with death to, um, you know, do you, does it take that level of concern to get you there? Um, maybe really something really, really difficult? Um, you know, God answers Jonah's prayer, and then he became angry. Look at chapter 4, in verse 1. But, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I, quick to, I was quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending a calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take my life away. Take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. 
But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? You get angry with God? If he doesn't answer your prayers correctly, uh, the way you want him to? Uh, I think we can forget, you know, to, um, and get frustrated if God doesn't give us what we want. Maybe not what you need, but he usually gives you, I mean, just what you need, not what you want. Right. We all have a lot of wants. I'm a, yeah, yeah I, got, I got a list of wants, but um, I try not to focus on them. You know, um, so, you know, I want to look at another example of prayer. If you turn over to Luke chapter 18. All right. Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 1. My voice is gone. Luke 18, verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that he should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town that kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice from my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I do not fear God or care about men, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she will eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? You know, oh, thanks, bro. Um, It's, um, it's a parable. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Uh, you know, the judge, you know, he got tired of listening to this woman. He finally granted her request. How much more? Do you tire God out with your prayers? Or do you get frustrated and just stop, you know? Um, do you really give your heart? And, uh, and, you know, God really wants to answer your prayers. He does. He wants to hear you talk. He wants to listen to you. Um, do you persevere? Perseverance is hard in prayer sometimes uh, because prayer is our hardest work as a Christian, as a disciple. Reading is pretty easy for most of us, but to pray, it takes a lot to get on your knees and cry out to God. You know. But turn over to James. Let's see how God answers prayers. In James chapter 5. James chapter 5. In verse 17, James 5, 17, right. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. You ever prayed for anything for three years? Five years? Yes. Yes. Ten years? I have a couple things I pray every day. I've been praying it for years. Um, but God, bless, he blesses perseverance. Yeah. You know, have you done anything like that? Do you think about things? Do you hold it near and dear to your heart? You, know, you pray with faith that God will answer it, regardless of your time yeah. and God's time. That's right. and with the specific prayers. You know, uh, again, I think we get the answers, but we're not even sure they're answers. God, you know, kind of lays it out for you, but it's like you keep praying because you didn't like it. You didn't like the results. You, know, you didn't like that answer. You know, um, but yeah, he answers regardless. Think about it. And sometimes we're not dialed in enough to even see the answers. You know? True. It's true. All right. Moving along. Turn back to Ephesians. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter three. Three. Ephesians three, verse 14. It says, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of the glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge 
that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. You know, God gives us the strength and the power you know, so that Jesus can dwell in our hearts. That's what it says, so that Christ can dwell in your inner being, in our hearts. You know, but we have to pray for it. It doesn't just happen. We've got to be empowered. Uh, Paul said, prayed for people to be empowered to get that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Look at another one back in Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, um, verse 18. <clears throat> this, I remember reading this scripture a long, long time ago. And I, it, was, it was fascinating to me. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So what do you think that means to pray that your eyes of your heart can be enlightened? I'll just we'll open it up. What do you think that means? Anybody? Some of you deep thinkers. What do you think that means? Anthony. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it comes to, you know, really going and digging into the Bible. Yeah, yeah, the deeper things. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Um, I think, well, the thing about, like, what the heart is, like, you know, the Bible says the heart is deceitful. And so, you know, sometimes, like, our heart will want to see certain things mm -hmm. rather than really want to see the truth. So it's like, we're praying that, you know, our eyes can actually see the truth. Yeah. The eyes of our heart. The eyes of your heart. Chris? Yeah, I think it is a spiritual eyes. Yeah. yeah. Did you have? Yeah, no, um, I mean, I think it mentions about hope right after. So I think mm -hmm. just being able to see where your hope really comes from and not put your hope in things that will never, that will never satisfy. Yeah. Your heart is not the pumper we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense? It's your emotions. Yeah. It's how you, everything about you is your heart. Yeah. And when you say, I love you with all my heart, you... you People that are married, like, I love you with my blood pump. <laughs> your heart is your, the seed. It's the seed of your emotions. It's everything of who we are. And so the deeper things of God get revealed. Amen. When your eyes are open, you let yourself feel. You got to let yourself feel. Now, don't feel too much because it can get you in trouble. Yeah. Don't live on your emotions. Let your heart feel. Just don't give into it. Uh, you know. <laughs> it will help you to be aware of the power of God. Have you ever, about eight years ago, the movie called Lucy. Raise your hand if you ever saw it. Lucy. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a great movie. I had to watch it again last night. Uh, it's about a woman who, it's, oh, what's her name? Scarlett Johansson's in. She's the lead person. And she becomes a mule. Somebody, uh, some drug runner puts some chemicals in a pouch in her stomach. And it breaks. She gets, yeah. she gets beat up and gets kicked, and the thing explodes. And so she gets this extreme power. Yeah. And so the screen shows she, when she's at 10% power, she can move objects and stuff. Uh, it's really a funny movie. It's pretty well done. Uh, and through the movie, she gets like 20%. And then she approaches Morgan Freeman, who's the professor that's been studying this, uh, this whole line of thinking. And so and then she gets about 50%, and she's like, she can do just about anything. Uh, she can kill people. She can make guns fly up to the ceiling and all this weird stuff. But it, when she reaches 100%, there's an explosion. And it's like, and uh, the, the, the director really did a good job. And she disappears. And so the guy that was helping her said, where is she? And Lucy comes back. She says, I'm everywhere. I'm everywhere. It's, it's pretty cool. The only reason I bring it up is she was using 100% of her power. Can you imagine what your prayers would be like if you had 100% in your prayer life? 
What does that look like? What are you using now? Five percent. I'm asking. I'm not asking for answers. Think. Ten percent. What did you do this morning? Was it one percent? If it was a hundred percent, we'd be probably have a different outcome today <laughs> for all of us. But I, I you know, I just thought about it. it's like, uh, and she at one point. Somebody, one of the students for Morgan Freeman said, well, what would happen if we have 100% of that? And he said, I don't know. And I don't think any of us know what it would be like if we had 100% of our prayers, if we gave 100% of our hearts to prayer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I just love that analogy. You know, how you feeling this morning? Were you self-reliant this morning? Did you have time with the Lord? Did you pray? Hopefully at least 1%. Did you get up this morning early? You know, Jesus went out while it was still dark. He got away from everybody so he could focus and think and pray. Um, I think it's, um, it's imperative that we, that we strive for something more. We can always do more. We can always do it, I think, better uh, than, you know. I think when our emotions can really dictate our lives, it can really cripple us. I mean, we need to think with our hearts and feel with them. But don't be ruled by them. Right. Don't be ruled by your emotions. Uh, and your emotions can be, uh, I mean, it could be anything. Worry, guilt, social status, money, fear, uh, all sorts of stuff uh, can really cripple us with, you know, our thoughts. I mean, everything starts here. Yeah. Yeah. Everything starts here. Um, don't let this one start. <laughs> it'll, it'll kill you. Um, it'll ruin your life. It's, um, it's really important to depend on God, like as yeah. much as you possibly can, yeah. and always raise the bar. Mm-hmm. My barometer is when I almost died scuba diving. Mm-hmm. I wish I could get to that. That was 100%. Yeah. Or 95, whatever it was, it was, it was, it was do or die. Yeah. Um, now, can you get there with, on the everyday? Mm-hmm. Probably not. Lucy could, but she got, <laughs> but that was brain power, it wasn't yeah. brain. Um, so let's look at one more scripture in Luke. On, Turn over the book of Luke. Luke uh, chapter 22. Luke 22, in verse 39. <clears throat> Luke 22, 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. His disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. You know, Jesus presented his request to God. But you, what, did he do, what did he do after that? He prayed to be surrendered. Are you surrendered to whatever God's going to give you? And without Jesus' surrender here, we wouldn't have salvation. He was surrendered his life to God. Um, it's, um, the cross calls us to surrender our hearts. You know. um, is there any area in your life this morning that you're not surrendered? Any area that you're not surrendered? Uh, maybe life's dealt you some hard things, some hard blows. I think we need to get there. You know, communion is a time, we're going to go into the communion right now, to uh, reflect on your heart. What was your week like this past week? Think about it. What kind of sin were you in? What did you do? Who did you hurt? Anybody hurt you? Did you hurt somebody? Did you say something with your tongue? You lashed out? Um, it's a time for us to reflect on who we are when we take the, uh, the bread and the juice. So um, let's pray for that right now.